This is the story of a young man living off the land who, with his loyal companion, is sent on a dangerous quest by a powerful wizard to stop an evil sorcerer. Along the way, he is aided by a powerful magical artifact, but must beware of using it, for its powers of corruption have twisted its previous owners, both physically and mentally, into a shadow of their former selves, now obsessed solely with reclaiming their precious treasure. This is, of course, Wizard's First Rule by Terry Goodkind. What did you think I was talking about? Lord of the Rings? Wizard's First Rule by Terry Goodkind is one of those fancy books you see quite often in charity shops or in secondhand bookshops. It is generally beloved by those who read it when it first came out or who picked it up um, when they were younger, but for the others who picked it up in their later years, it is more of a, a bunch of stereotypical fantasy cliches thrown haphazardly together with no plan and tied up with weak philosophy. When I did creative writing at uni, one of the things we were taught over and over again, because it is such an important element of writing, is to read. Read every day, read anything and everything you can get your hands on. Because just as a car needs fuel to go, writers need that inspiration to continue with their craft. And nowhere is this lesson more proven than with Terry Goodkind, um, though now sadly passed away. In life he repeatedly said that he did, didn't have time to read, especially not other people's novels, history books I think he read, but not novels. Um, and in fact the only author he seems to have read is Anne Rand. And boy does it show. Okay, so I exaggerate a little with him having only read Anne Rand. He has also read Dean Koontz. And obviously has watched at least one of the Lord of the Rings films at some point. Maybe half asleep. Um, but today's book, The Wizard's First Rule, is the first book in the Sword of Truth series and is a contemporary character-driven masterpiece about real people and definitely not a fantasy. At least that's what Mr Goodkind thinks if you've read or watched any of his interviews. He will take almost any opportunity to talk about how his work is not fantasy because he doesn't want it to be fantasy because he doesn't want to alienate any potential readers who don't like fantasy. Never mind all the potential readers who don't like gritty realism. Now usually I advocate against the death of the author as I just don't think you can ever truly separate art from artist. But in this case, to say the sort of truth set in a fantastical world with magic and dragons and wizards is not fantasy, is objectively wrong. Fantasy books don't have to just be fantasy, they can often be deep or allegorical or metaphorical in essence, teaching the reader something about the real world or people through fantastical elements. In Patrick Ness's A Monster Calls, the monster, a sentient tree, is a heartbreakingly stunning representation of the main character's emotions as he goes through a period of intense suffering. In Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell, the magic system serves to highlight the prejudices, values and attitudes of Regency society and explore themes of racism, sexism and classism. Hell, even in Harry Potter, there are elements of the magic system that are representative of deeper issues and ideas surrounding love and sacrifice. The fact these works are fantasy does not diminish their messages, but actually enhances them. So to think that a piece of fantasy cannot simultaneously be a deep, thought-provoking story about real people and issues is at worst insulting and at best ignorant. But maybe, maybe Terry was just ignorant and actually his fantastical elements in his totally not a fantasy fantasy book are just metaphors for the deeper themes he claims to be writing about. Except they're not. They're flat. They're just there because Terry thought it would be cool. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. Um, what is it about? For those who don't know, um, the, as I said, The Wizard's First Rule is the first of this sort of truth series, but it does also work as a standalone. It follows Richard Cipher, who I imagine is a relative of this guy. Name's Bill Cipher, and I take it you're some kind of living ventriloquist dummy? And so it probably looks like this. I'm gonna drink it like a person! <laughs> Cipher Jr. is a woods guide. Strange vines um, have started growing in the woods following his father's gruesome murder. Um, after saving the mysterious but beautiful Callan from danger, Richard is appointed by his old friend Zed as the Seeker, who bestows upon him the Sword of Truth, a magical but corruptive weapon powered by rage. But evil is afoot. 
Darken Rahl, which is the most evil name I've heard in my life, is after the boxes of Auden in order to take over the world. And so Richard, Callan and Zed must find the final box before Rahl does. Along the way, Richard and Callan fall madly in love. Zed eats a lot um, and Richard develops a penchant for killing first and asking questions later. But Rahl is also after Richard. Perhaps this has something to do with the Book of Counted Shadows his father kept before he died. <gasps> as I said, it does work as a standalone. So if you want to check it out without getting sucked into a series of 22 odd novels, not including the spin-offs, go read it. Just, uh, just ignore the whole sequel baiting at the end. Oh, I know we'll meet again some sunny day. So I was going to go into a spiel about not daring to criticise the work of a master craftsman such as Terry Goodkind, and thus writing a list of about what I learnt from this book, as opposed to the pros and cons I do do. But literally after only like two points I gave up because it was frustrating not being able to explain my feelings plainly. So we're just going to have a list of pros and cons, as usual. There is certainly a sense of the epic in all the side quests and adventures, and the evilness of the villains did make it quite pleasing when they met their comeuppance. There was this scene I quite enjoyed um, where some royal twits are, are partaking in the drink of enlightenment. But unbeknownst to them, the chefs had spilt the actual drink and then had made a fake replacement. And so the queen drinks it and she's like, oh, why does it taste different? And the head chef makes up this nonsense about it, like being made with special ingredients to boost its enlightening, enlightenment power. Um, and she's like, oh yeah, I can feel it now. Um, like the Empress of Clothes. Anyway, I enjoyed that scene, even if it was arguably lifted from Hans Christian Andersen, but whatever. Also, there was a cat, and the cat was good and brave and saved people's lives and ended up with a nice new home and survived, which is always nice to see. For some reason, cats are always either evil or dead. This one was good and alive, so that was, yeah, that made me happy. Let's see if I can keep this simple. Um, honestly, it, it got to the stage where I was just blitzing through this book as fast as possible because I just wanted to be done and therefore I didn't write down any notes or at least not many notes um, so I probably missed a bunch of stuff but never mind firstly the writing style um, I didn't care for it some people say that despite the content sucking he at least has a strong authorial voice if by that you mean he writes clunky description, tells rather than shows over eggs emotion and explains far too much of the minutiae and far too little of the world, then I agree. Um, I mean, like, it was adjusted too tight. Its last user having been smaller than Richard is a line from the book. Like, thanks. Thanks, Terry. I wouldn't have been able to work that out otherwise. Also, um, had the line, Richard was furious. He felt cheated. Next page. He felt calm. You can't just have your characters announce how they feel. That makes me feel angry. Secondly, I found uh, this book very stereotypical and the twists kind of sucked. Um, like every time there was a mystery, just think of the most cliched fantastical or fantasy explanation. And that's probably the answer. Um, and I mean, literally, Gollum was in this. Sure, they called him Samuel, which is only a stone story from Smeagol. But he was Gollum. And Zed. Z Zed, literally, was just there to explain stuff and to make Richard look cool. And I'm not being harsh, Terry Goodkind actually said this. Thirdly, the insta-love is painful, Richard and Callan are friends straight away, and days later are madly in love, despite not really having any chemistry, no real conversations, aren't dramatic or edgy. And, uh, I mean, a lot of, I think, these sort of fantasy books fall into this trap. You don't fall in love with someone because they have some dark, terrible past they can't talk about without crying. You fall in love with them bit by bit with, with stories and jokes and, and little nothings that end up being everything and, and, and none of them get it. None of them are romantic. They're just... they're just edgy. No. <laughs> Fourthly, I didn't care for the world building. Um, it was pretty bland and forgettable for the most part. But considering world building seems to be an element of the normal fantasy fiction that good kind looks down on, Maybe that shouldn't be so surprising. Uh, but from a writing perspective, you need to set the scene. Moments like the arrival um, across the barrier into the mystery world, or the magical world, 
should feel important and instead it was so underwritten that I didn't even notice they'd arrived in the magical world and I had to reread that but again to check and I was like oh it's just because they don't say anything about it that's boring. That sucks. Another issue with the world building is the setting up of mystery and tension. Um, this is all down to how details are shown and explained. Um, the worst example of this is with Callan, who is something called a confessor, specifically the mother confessor. And we know this quite early on because um, many characters recognise her for what she is and keep going, oh my gosh, she's a confessor. Oh no. Oh, oh how terrible. Um, like, you know, proper upping the ante and setting up the moment when Richard will find out but then he doesn't for ages and neither do we so we don't know what Confessor is and it just becomes very frustrating from it's brought up and then there's no dramatic irony because we don't know what it is and and Richard still doesn't know what it is and by the time that we and Richard do find out what it is the mystery of the Confessor feels less like a character mystery and more like a detail of the world like it doesn't make you go back and rethink her previous interactions it, and it's just drawn out for so long, you don't care anymore. Fifthly, the philosophies explored and s supposed depth of character and all that is actually very weak and, dare I say it, juvenile. And yet, despite this, Goodkind spends ages explaining these simple thought experiments and discussions, which is probably why this book is like nearly 300,000 miles long. Um, I also find the glorification of rage concerning, especially as Richard isn't meant to be morally grey or anything. Um, actually, he's meant to be like a paragon, a heroic figure, and yet he jumps to murder super quickly um, over crimes nowhere near worthy of capital punishment. And is apparently being corrupted by the sword, which is clearly evil, right? Right? Sixthly, the tone is inconsistent. Clearly, Terry wants us to take this book seriously, but then he writes a scene about a witch hunting mob, which the main characters defeat by scaring them, which is always a good idea when people want to kill you, and then talking at them for 30 minutes, and then punishing them by vanishing that which they hold most precious or dear. Their, um, their, their, their manly bits. Which they think to check, by the way. Um, and then doesn't give him back until they admit that Richard was right all along. And there is, along with the childish humour, the insta-love, the stupid and sort of modern dialogue, um, the characters you'd find in a kid's cartoon, like you know, the one who's always hungry, the spoiled princess. Um, but, but then you have these really brutal scenes of gore and, and these themes of sexual violence. And it, it's a very confusing book. Seventhly, arguably, this is kind of like sexist and racist. Um, like the mud people uh, who feel like they are coded for non-white people just in the way they're sort of written about and they have this reputation of being really dangerous but actually are uh, fine um, but then they have these backwards ideas and they stand in the way of the greater good for silly traditions and have problems that Richard has to fix for them but of course the elders don't like this they don't want to accept his help because they're really stupid ha 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 and, and it just feels generally like a, a stereotype and also they're called the mud people. And if we look at them as coded for non-white people, calling them mud people is pretty offensive, especially in the light of those, like, pears adverts of old. And then the women in this, some of the representation just rubbed me the wrong way. I mean, Callan is super powerful and all that, but for the most of the plot, she just doesn't really do very much and is, like, just there to make Richard look cool. And, I mean, who am I kidding? Every character is there to make Richard look cool. And there's also this incredible amount of focus on Callan's looks. She is very beautiful and has long hair, and these apparently are her defining traits. And then you have the whole thing about the, the normal women not liking her because they're jealous of her insane beauty and her power, as if women are incapable of being pleased for each other. And in general, it's just like this undercurrent of dull female stereotypes that just seem to underpin a lot of this 20th century fantasy literature. It is also sort of sexist towards men as well. Um, when it's finally explained what a confessor is, there's this whole thing about how why only women are allowed to be confessors because men are just too corruptible. They all will always abuse the power to subjugate women because that's what all men are like. Whereas women are just so nice and good and pure. They're too, they're too pure to do that. Uh, really? <laughs> We're doing that, really? And, and then you have like the Maud Sith, who are also all women. But they're like really corrupted and evil and sexual and wear tight red leather jumpsuits and 
but the confessors, they wear white flowing dresses and the confessor's touch is super deadly to the Maud Sith. And there's just so much you can read into that, especially if you've um, looked into the, the, the virgin versus the harlot um, dynamic you get in a, in a lot of these sorts of, of books and media. Eighthly, 200 pages of this book are taken up with good kinds BDSM fantasy. It's unnecessary, chock-a-block with tired cliches and just unpleasant to read. And not in a, this is so gritty and realistic and forces you to confront uncomfortable truths within society and yourself sort of way, but in a, I don't want to read about good kinds favourite choice of adult content sort of a way. Ninthly, Richard is obs, super smart and powerful and strong, and he always works out the answer, even when there aren't any clues to the answer, he just knows. And the only thing that the mud people can do that he can't do is use this whistle to attract birds. But then he's actually really good at that, he just... in the next scene that it was used in, without practising it between, so... <laughs> he doesn't need to practise, he's Richard! <laughs> Um, and obviously he of course manages to tame the red dragon, which are meant to be super duper aggressive and, and dangerous, but pff, nah, not for Richard. <laughs> Tenthly, spoiler alert, the day is literally saved by the power of love. <laughs> I am not even kidding, <laughs> holy hell. And finally, a bonus tidbit that made me laugh. I think dragons use magic to fly, observes Kalan. Not, you know, their wings. <laughs> Don't be stupid. And also, you know, I guess birds are magic too. <laughs> what can I say? I didn't like it. I, I sort of understand why some people like it. Sort of. Like, it is exciting at times, but on the whole it takes far too long to say not very much. The characters are stereotypes, they feel like the sort of cardboard cutouts you get in those ten a penny fantasies from the 70s and 80s. But this came out in 94. Uh, Good Khan was very proud of the fact that this book ended up in auction and was bought for an amount that broke the record for a fantasy novel by a first-time author. But honestly, I think that says less about the quality of his book and more about the quality of fantasy literature at the time. Um, anyway, apparently you can't talk about Good Khan's book without mentioning his controversial statements, so I'll touch on them very briefly. If you want to hear more, Daniel Green has a far more in-depth video about it, but simply put, Good kind has been slammed many times for coming across as arrogant and condescending when talking to basically anyone. Aside from basically never reading anything by other authors apart from the occasional Anne Randall Dean Koontz, um, although he claims to love books, Toe Goodkind likes taking the time to remind young people that they are too thick to write novels and just shouldn't try. Although he also said this, which is ironic because he basically just described his own book. Also, let's just forget about Charles Dickens, who had four novels under his belt by the time he was 28, including Oliver Twist. Uh, Victor Hugo, who began writing at 22 and was published at 24. Somerset Maugham, who was first published at 23. Zadie Smith, who published her famous book White Teeth at 22. And Mary Shelley, who published her classic novel Frankenstein when she was 21, but actually conceived the idea with its depth of character and masterfully explored themes when she was just 17. But pfft, who's ever heard of those people, right? I mean, <laughs> Frankenstein, you know, that sucked. And also, um, if any of you are thinking you'd really like to be a writer, but you don't know where to start, Terry's got you back. Just don't try, you'll clearly suck. Um, there was also his uncalled for comments of mockery about the Wheel of Time author Robert Jordan, when the latter was unable to make an event due to uh, a health condition, because he was terminally ill at the time. His dismissal of comments about similarities between the Wheel of Time and this sort of truth, by claiming people seeing those similarities were just too young to read his books, uh, and being totally disrespectful to an artist by mocking his work and encouraging his fans to do the same. He did apologise for that last one. Sort of. Finally, the big one, uh, Goodkind's insistence that his work is not fantasy, despite being the most stereotypical fantasy book I have ever read. I mean, say what you will about the world rose, there were hints of originality, even if they were deeply buried underneath rubbish. And after being called out for this, Terry Goodkind actually responded to explain what he meant and how um, this quote had been taken out of context. You see, it's not that his work isn't fantasy, it's that his work is so much better than other fantasy books and he didn't want to be lumped in with them. There's probably tons more I could say about him and his work, um, but I don't want to, so I won't. 
there's only one more journey I am willing to make into his world and that is to at some point not necessarily now to read an Anne Rand novel uh, specifically Anthem which I have chosen for two reasons firstly it is the one that good kind of places as his favorite book and secondly it's a novella because there is no way I am battling with the 600,000 word that make up Atlas Shrugged and that's all I'm saying I need to go and have a nap Goodbye.